edition character in honor of Halloween. I'm going to be doing two of these for more spooky kind of inspired classes. So let's just jump right into it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to build an Aarakocra warlock of the Fiend Pact. Okay. And for those of you who don't really know much about Dungeons and Dragons, I'll explain a bit more, but I basically am just going to set up the idea for the character first, and then I'm going to run through the stats and the spells and, you know, all the nitty-gritty stuff, but first I'm just going to do a little character creation. So I don't have a name picked out yet, but I will find one that's not necessary yet. You know, you need a name, but you can even put that at the very last or make it the first thing you do really up to you um but yeah i had this idea right so eric Akra, which i will show you a picture of one um basically a bird person like uh, like an eagle usually they don't not necessarily have to be but here's from dnd beyond and their website so maybe you can get an idea there. Kind of like an eagle person, right? And again, if you want to make them look more like a pelican or something, I don't know, you know, whatever. But that's typically how they are um, depicted. So, yeah, they do fly. So that's one of the benefits of picking them. So I'm going with an Aarakocra. And I'm going with Warlock with the Fiend Pact. So... A warlock, for those of you who don't know, is basically a magic user that is not born with the powers, right? Like a like a sorcerer is, and they don't train to mag learn magic like a wizard does, like the Harry Potter. They go to school, they go through schooling for years upon years, and then they, you know, really become like a full fledged wizard. Um, but a warlock is someone who makes a pact or an agreement with a powerful entity could be a god or a just a very powerful creature from a different dimension and in return they get certain powers and spells and abilities that they can use um, but they're just kind of adherent to their patron um, which could be very active in their life and giving them a lot of demands or it could be very very relaxed and relaxed and not very uh, pushy you know it, it, there's a lot of role playing potential with that um, but basically you have a boss, you know, someone you pledged yourself to for whatever reason in exchange for these powers. So I'm doing a fiend pact, but she's actually going to be a good character. Okay, so what I'm thinking is the person that she's going to, or the entity that she's going to have a pact with is Pazuzu. Okay, so Pazuzu is a demon right? So in Dungeons and Dragons lore's lore, there are demons and devils, okay? So the demons are the more chaotic entities, and the devils are very, very lawful, strict, and organized, have extremely detailed hierarchy, and the demons is basically just a giant free-for-all, right? So uh, basically, there is uh, the nine hells, which are nine layers of hell, each ruled by a devil, um, and then you have demon lords, which I don't know how many layers. I think there's like 64 or something really weird and very uh, large amount, <laughs> a lot more, you know, because they're always constantly fighting over each other and certain demon lords go up and down in hierarchy. Sometimes they're the lord of like three or four little pocket dimensions or whatever layers as they call them. Pazuzu is the lord of basically think of think of the abyss this way here's the abyss and there's a series of i believe it's 64 i don't know could be 300 i don't know whatever maybe i made up that number but a bajillion different layers of the abyss and to get to one layer to another layer basically you can hop through these portals right so basuzu is the demon lord of whatever layer of the abyss has all of these portals that allow the different demon lords and other individuals to switch between the different levels uh, 
Pazuzu is also known as the Lord of Frogs and is basically the lord or the demon lord who represents flying demons in particular, right? That's their specialty. So they don't really own um, a specific level per se, but they own all of the sky and all of the air of every layer. It's really weird, right? That's how it's usually described. So Pazuzu is one of the more powerful, but maybe like top 10, 15-ish, you know? Because they don't own any physical land per se, but more of all the space between all the layers. Yeah, it's weird. So, Pazuzu, their thing that they're known for is corruption. That's really what they're about, corruption. That's their speciality. So, Pazuzu's greatest delight is taking the most good, the most pious, the most holy individuals and souring them and corrupting them. That's where they get the most pleasure and enjoyment out of. That's where their big evil acts stem from, is taking people who are good and making them evil. They are obsessed with corruption. I mean, other demon lords like corruption, but that's Pazuzu's whole thing, is they are known to, you know, start a cult with a different name. Uh, could be um, could be Zoo, could be Pazel, or um, Pazel, or um, Zubal, or something weird. It could be less obvious than that, but they create a cult, right? And they generally think that this is a good god who grants them gifts, positive gifts. You do something for me, I give you something in return. That's usually what happens. And they start like easy enough exchanges like, oh, in order to get a uh, hundred gold as a gift, go give a kid an apple. Okay, that's awesome. That's totally worth it. That's a great deed. But then it becomes a little bit harder, right? So the next one might be take away an apple from a kid or steal from a homeless man. And then it just gradually gets darker and darker as you get higher and higher rewards for these deeds. Um, and meanwhile, Bazuzu or this fake Bazuzu gold kind of thing will slowly corrupt you into it um, and turn you into an evil soul. That's usually like Bazuzu's number one thing. So their favorite things, they go after the most pure hearted and innocent people, the most biased paladins and clerics. And that's who they really, 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 really enjoy corrupting. So that's Bazuzu's whole spiel. So basically, my character made a pack with Bazuzu under the name Basil, right? So like Basil, Basil, but with a good B, Basil, right? So they ended up joining this cult and pledging themselves and getting warlock powers because they thought it was a good thing, right? So in essence, um, you know, they got dragged into a weird cult. They're just an everyday, average person. Um, I'm putting it as their merchant, so I'm saying that they were a jeweler, and they made and sold, like, necklaces, bracelets, etc. And they turned to this cult just because they wanted to, one, protect themselves while they're going between different trade cities and trade routes and exchanging goods to have a form of protection and magical powers and to use it for good as they can while they're out traveling between routes. And so they ended up joining this weird cult that one of their bodyguards got into and then yada yada whatever. That's the general idea I want to go for. So they're actually a good character and they're going to be slowly corrupted by this demonic entity um, or they're going to fight it and find a way to break out of Basil Pazuzu's grasp and get a new deity, uh, get patron warlock powers somewhere else, right? Find a new patron who's a good patron and basically fix those mistakes. Meanwhile, they're going to kind of have to face this constant sense of like, Okay, I need these powers in order to do good for myself, but in order to keep them, I have to gradually do a little bit more sketchy things. So it's a matter of like, okay, what's that point in that line that I'm willing to cross to keep these powers, to do good with them, um, and trying to kind of counteract and balance that act, right? That's essentially what my character is going to be about, a good person struggling with a demon, in essence, right? So I'm doing a warlock because I think that's kind of a cool idea for... Um, Halloween kind of thing, and then I'm going to
to do a necromancer, most likely, on another video around Halloween-ish time, too. So, anyway, let's just jump into it. We're going to do a pretty low-level character, so I can plow through this pretty quickly. First thing is you need to look up the stats for an Aarakocra. Um, I don't have a book that has Aarakocra, so I'm just using D&D Beyond, the website. Um, not sponsored. I wish it was, but, you know, yeah, maybe one day. Uh, and pulling up the stats from there. So, let's jump in to that. Okay. So, they are a medium creature. So, size is going to be medium. Okay. Just remember that. I don't even need to bother with it. Uh, walking speed is 25. Pretty standard. Okay, but we have a flying speed of 50 feet, so 50 feet of fly, okay, so speed, a body of 25, with a little note there, a little bit of an asterisk, okay, I have talons, so I can hit with an unarmed strike. That deals, so we'll do talons under weapon. Okay, and that deals 1d4 damage plus my strength mod. Okay, cool. What else do we need here? Okay, they're going to get a plus 2 on their dexterity and a plus 1 on their wisdom. See if there's anything else. Okay, languages. So by default, you are going to know common, which is what most people know in this world. Um, Aracakra, so they have their own language. Okay, and then Orin. which is an elemental dialect, so it's like the language of those entities that live in the elemental plane of air. Okay, so first thing we're going to do now that we got the different racial stats for being an Aarakocra. should probably write that under race. Okay, I'm going to roll up these stats. So we have strength, how strong you are, dexterity, how nimble, uh, your constitution, how many hit points you have, and be able to, uh, you know, resist poisons and bodily fatigue. Intelligence is how book smart you are. Wisdom is more like common sense. Uh, charisma is more like uh, your ability to persuade people to negotiate. You know, people are going to like you more the more charismatic you are. That kind of thing. So, first thing, I'm going to roll the dice. Okay, so I turned down the volume a bit for this. I am rolling four six-sided dice. And what I do for this, and what my friends usually do, is either an array, which is like a preset list of stats that you just plug into wherever you want, or you roll four d6, four six-sided dice, and you remove the lowest and you can re-roll ones. Okay. So I'm going to re-roll the one that I rolled. And I got a six out of it, so cool. So then I'm going to take away the lowest, which is a three. So I'm left with six, three, and four. So six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. So I get a thirteen in one of my stats. So I'm just going to write that down on the corner of my paper next to my stats. Reroll a one. Okay, so I got two sixes and a five, so that's a 17 on that roll. Good job. 
That's always good, don't you think? I mean, if the best you can roll is an 18, can't complain about that. Okay, I'm gonna take away the two because it's the lowest I got. And that's gonna be five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 12 on that score. Okay, rolling again. Reroll a one. Okay, take away the lowest, which is a two. So I have six, four, and three. So six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Thirteen. Roll again. Okay, take away the lowest, which is a three. I have six, four, and three, so six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen again.
is a 2. 16 and 17 is a 3. So I'm going to put a 3 in dexterity. Constitution is at 13, so 1. Intelligence is at 13, so 1. Wisdom is at 14, so that belongs to 2. And Charisma is at 17, so that's a 3 bonus. Plus 3, you dice roll. Okay, and I'm just going to put them up to level 3. That's usually where my friends start when we play. Warlock, level, level three. Okay, I'm going to fill in some things pretty quickly here now. So my initiative score, that determines if you go first or second or third or fourth or turn or in combat. Uh, right now that's just based off of your dexterity modifier, which is three. Okay, we're going to go through your saving throws here. So, let's see, for a warlock here, it is... <laughs> Wisdom and Charisma. So, I'm going to fill in the bubbles here for Wisdom and Charisma. Like that. Strength. I'm gonna go one. Dexterity is three. Constitution is one. Intelligence is one. Wisdom would normally be two, but I'm proficient in it. So it's gonna increase up to two more points. So instead of it being a two, it's gonna become a four. And then I am proficient in charisma saving throws as well which is normally a three, but because I'm proficient in it, it becomes a five, because I'm adding two. Math. Okay, so now we have our skills. So, as a warlock, I can choose between arcana, deception, history, intimidation, investigation, nature, and religion. So, I'm going to go with... Um, because again, my character was originally a merchant or a jeweler, so I'm gonna go with deception. And I'll go with history. So that plus two bonus that I get on my saving throws are also gonna be applied into those uh, skills there. Okay. Then, if you recall earlier, my character's a merchant, right? So I'm gonna go to the background section. So before you started adventuring, what kind of work did you do? In 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, you get some certain benefits based off of the kind of work that you did before you became an adventurer of your background. So because I'm going with like a merchant, I am going to Add a little something, something here. Oh, I'm in the wrong section. That would make sense. Yeah. Feet. I need backgrounds. Duh. Hold on one second while I find it. Okay, so for merchant, I'm gonna do a guild artisan is how they would best qualify that. So under my background here, guild artisan. Okie dokie. That gives me skill proficiencies in insight and in persuasion. So I'm going to fill that in with insights and persuasion. Okay. Then I am a proficient in one set of artisan tools of my choosing. Okay. And if you go down a bit, you can add a set of artisan tools of your choice in your inventory when you start the game. So... I'm just 
just going to put a jeweler's kit. I don't know if that exists or not, but if not, I'll find something more suitable later on, you know. Jeweler's kit. I can make little mod, you know, quick little modifications to jewelry, repairs and whatnot. Okay, so I learn an additional language. Okay, cool. So I am going to do abyssal. It doesn't really fit with being a merchant that I would be able to speak with demons, but it fits my character's whole backstory with being a warlock of Pazuzu. Um, I'm going to say that they just picked that up once they joined the cult and started getting powers. You know, they, or maybe they learned Orin from being a merchant, whatever. Have fun with it, people. Don't be too strict. Um, I'm also going to get an extra 15 gold. And a set of traveler's clothes. Cool, so I have another pair of clothes that I need to change out for whatever reason. Alright, cool. That takes care of the background portion. Now I'm going to plow through these skills. Okay, acrobatics is dexterity, so that is... Three, animal handling is wisdom, so that is two. Arcana is intelligence, so that is one. Um, athletics is strength, so that is one. Deception is charisma, so that's three. But I have proficiency in it, so it becomes a five. History is intelligence, which I have one, but I'm proficient in it, so it becomes a three. Insight is wisdom. I have a two in wisdom, but it becomes a four because I'm proficient in it. So I add two. Intimidation is charisma. I have three. Investigation is intelligence. One. Medicine is wisdom is two. Nature is intelligence is one. Perception is wisdom, which is two. Performance is charisma, which is three. Persuasion is charisma, which is three, but I add my proficiency to it. So that becomes five. Religion is intelligence, so that's one. Sleight of hand is dexterity, so that's three. Survival is dexterity, so that is three. And stealth is three. Okay. Cool. I'll fill in passive wisdom as well, or passive perception, whatever. Um, that is just going to be 12. So that is just 10 plus your perception skill of 2. So let's say you're not actively looking for something, but you're in a dungeon and you don't specifically declare, I'm actively looking for traps or whatever, and you're just walking down. Uh, that's just like your baseline. So a dungeon master um, can basically just use that number as a way of pre-rolling your dice as the perfect average. I don't, I don't know, whatever, it doesn't matter too much. I'm not trying to teach you all the rules of the game in this. Okay, so for hit points, what we do for your health is for a warlock, it is 1d8 per warlock level. Okay, plus your constitution modifier. Okay, so level one, you're gonna get a full eight. You're good. You don't even have to roll for it. So eight plus my constitution modifier of one is gonna give me nine hit points right off the bat. So you can either roll a 1d8, which is an eight-sided dice, and then add your constitution modifier, or you can take the perfect average plus one. So in this case, an eight, right? So that's going to be five, right? So what's the middle, right? Between a five, or between an eight and a one, right? Is four. So you just round up by one. Because that's just how it works. Whatever. Uh, I 
and you can just take your your average if you want. It's an option that some people do. So I just like doing that. I like sticking to the average. Okay, so that is five. So that's going to be six per level. So I'm leveling up to level three. So I'm going to have nine plus six plus six. That's how many points I'm going to have. Twenty-one. Okay, for hit dice, that's three. It's based off your level. Sometimes you can get some added and retracted for different magical reasons, but whatever, it doesn't really matter too much. Okay, so that's going to knock out a decent amount of the stuff. Uh, what else are we going to need? Yeah, we're going to need class-specific abilities up to level three. So let's jump into that. So the first one is Otherworldly Patron. Okay, at first level, you struck a bargain with uh, a choice of Archfey, Fiend, or Great Old One. There's other ones in different books that they added on, but this is just like the core basics. Um, and so we're going to do Fiend. So I'm going to write down in this uh, Features and Traits box, I'm just going to write Fiend Patron. Fiend Patron Pazuzu.
besides cantrips. Cantrips are smaller spells that you can cast as much as you want. But I can cast two level spells, two level one spells a day. But I know four different spells, so I can choose between which spells I want to cast. And it says here that I know two invocations. Okay. So I will make a note of that in this section, actually. Two info. I'll get into that in a second. Actually, why not now? Um, so basically, you can manipulate usually your cantrips. It's just an added bonus or an ability based off of your spells. And you can get these invocations, which just increase that spell. So usually Eldritch Blast is your main attacking spell as a warlock that you can cast as many times as you want per day because it's a cantrip. Your invocations will, one, it can allow you to deal additional damage or it can push or pull an opponent spaces in front or behind them, you know, push and pull like effect. Uh, it has a few other like little things here, but that's what an invocation is. I'll circle back to it more when we're worrying about our spells because it's tied into that. Okay, at third level, you get a Pact Boon. So you can either do Pact of the Chain, which lets you summon a familiar, which is basically a cute little pet. Pact of the Blade, which lets you summon like a sword or a similar weapon. It has some extra benefits, I believe. Um, that you can create it and make it disappear at will. Uh, and a few other things. Bonuses to attacks and whatever, I don't know. On the top of my head. Uh, Back to the Tomb gives you additional spells. I kind of like that one. That's usually what I go with. Um, so we're going to go with Back to the Tomb just because it's my personal favorite. Because I like having more spells and more options. So I'm going to go with Pact of the Tomb. Pact of the Tomb. And you don't really have to write all the nitty-gritty details. Just enough information that you can get a decent idea of it and know where to find it. You know, you can just scroll back through your book and read it off if you want to use it. But for me, I've been playing the game a while. I know the general gist of most of these things. So, um... feature choose three cantrips from any class's spell list and they don't have to be from the same spell list and yeah that's it you just learn three cantrips from any spell list of any different type of um, caster you know if you want to learn uh, cleric or wizard or sorcerer or whatever bard whatever you want gives you more cantrips. So I'm just going to mark on my cantrips that I know three more. And separate them out so I just know that they're special and I can choose them from any class. And I believe that's all I need to know for now. Yep. Awesome. So before we get to that, I'm going to go on to your armor, your weapons, yada yada. Let me get to the right page. Okay, so for warlocks, it states that you are proficient in light armor. Okay, so that gives me access to either padded leather or studded leather. So I'm going to go with studded leather here. That is going to give me a 12 plus my dexterity modifier to my armor class. That's how you determine your armor class. So 12 and then my dexterity modifier is 3. So that's 15. So my armor class is 15. So if someone tries to hit me, they roll a 20-sided dice. They add their attack bonus of, let's say, 3. If they can equal or break my armor class, then the attack goes through. That's all that means. 
Okay, simple weapons. So I know simple weapons. There's different categories like simple, martial, and exotic. And sometimes some classes just specifically list what what uh, weapons you can and can't use. So all that says for me is I'm restricted to simple weapons. So if you can, I'm going to use dexterity based weapons instead of strength weapons just because my dexterity is higher. So I'm going to look for that. So it's going to need to say finesse. So for simple, the only finesse weapon I see is a dagger, which is 1d4 damage. Okay. Now, I could, in theory, pick like a quarter staff or a mace or something like that, which does higher damage at like 1d6, for example. But I'm not going to hit as often, and I get to add 2 damage or I get to add 3 damage onto my dexterity, um, and add 3 to hit versus adding 1 to hit an extra 1 damage. So it kind of is actually smarter still, statistically, to just go with the dagger. Just because it's either I'm adding plus 1 or I'm adding plus 3, you know, so it's, it's still better to stick with the dagger. But I have talents anyway, so if someone takes my dagger, I'll just claw at them. It makes no difference. It's still the exact same stats as my talons for being a bird person. Dagger, 1d4. So my attack bonus from that is 5, 3 plus my proficiency of 2. Same for the talons. 1d4 plus 3 damage. Because again, my dexterity mod goes into that. That's going to be it. I mean, I can do a ranged thing. I don't really see the point of it because I'm just going to be spamming a spell called Eldritch Blast, which just shoots beams of energy from a distance anyway. So I'm not even going to bother with it right now. Yeah, so that's going to be it. Now I'm going to look at my spells, and then I'm basically going to be done wrapping this up. So I'm going to go to the Warlock section and look at spell. First one, obviously, is going to be Eldritch Blast. It's essential. You basically need it to play a warlock. It's your bread and butter. So I wrote that down. Uh, the other options are Blight War, Chill Touch, Eldritch Blast, Friends, Mage Hand, Minor Illusion, Poison Spray. I'm going to go with Minor Illusion. Okay, and again, I get to pick three more from any combination of spell classes that I like. I love message. It's a wizard cantrip, so I'm absolutely going to do message. It's very useful. It allows you to telepathically exchange like a sentence or two with a character in a certain distance that's pretty far away, and then they can reply to you. So it gives you a very limited telepathy or telepathic abilities. It's fun and useful in the game, just in general. Let's see what else. Let me scroll through just a pinch. Okay. So, I am then going to do Mage Hand and Vicious Mockery. Mage Hand is wizard. I believe bards and sorcerers also get it, if I'm not mistaken. And Vicious Mockery is just a bard ability. So I am writing that down under cantrips. Okay. And then I know four different level one warlock spells. So I'm going to flip to that for warlocks and decide what warlock spells I want. Okay, so now that I have that, uh, I'm just going to go through the the Fiend Pact and the benefits I get for my patron, and then I'm going to do my invocations, and then I'm just going to explain what all these spells I have do, but I have X, 
Arms of Hadar, Armor of Akathis, and Charm Person. So for my Fiend Pact, I get some additional spells. So at first level, I learn Burning Hands and Command. So I'm going to add that to my list. Burning Hands and Command because of my fiendish pension. Then I have an ability called the Dark One's Blessing. Starting at first level, when you reduce a hostile creature to zero hit points, you gain temporary hit points equal to your charisma modifier plus your warlock level. Okay, so basically you get a little bit of a cushion on your HP whenever you kill a creature. So I'm just going to jot down the Dark One's Blessing and a little bit of a note about it. So that is... Kill enemy. Get temp HP equal three plus level, which is three right now. So you get six extra hit points as a buffin, a buffin, a buffer. You know what I mean? Uh, and that is it until level six, so nothing else. So invocation. I get to choose from two invocations. So I'm going to choose Agonizing Blast, which is when you cast the Eldritch Blast spell, add your Charisma modifier to the damage it is dealt on a hit. So normally most magic spells, you don't add any extra damage based off of your casting ability, in this case Charisma, but this allows me to do it. So whenever I hit an opponent with an Eldritch Blast, it deals three extra damage. And the next one I'm going to pick is, let's see, I'm going to go with Eldritch Spear, because again, my character can fly um, twice as fast as it can walk on the ground. So being able to fly 50 feet a turn on my movement um, is going to be awesome with increasing my range of my spell by quite a bit. So Eldritch Spear Blast Increased to 300 feet. Okie dokie. Yeah, and a few other good ones that I thought would be kind of fun is uh, Mask Many Faces. You can disguise self at will without spending a spell slot. You can just change your physical appearance and your, uh, you know, you can look to look like a human or an elf or a dwarf or whatever you want. Um, repelling Blast is fun. You push a creature 10 feet and you hit it from a straight line away from you when you hit them with Eldritch Blast. It's good if they're standing next to a cliff or something, for example. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I'm going to read off what the spells do that they have real quick. Eldritch Blast. A beam of crackling energy streaks towards a creature within range, making a ranged spell attack against the target. On a hit, the target makes or takes 1d10 force damage, so a 10-sided dice. And then, because of my Eldritch Invocation, um, I'm going to add 3 to that damage, so roll a 10-sided dice and add 3. That's how much damage it deals. Um, the spell creates one more than one beam. Hold on. I can't speak. The spell creates more than one beam when you reach higher levels. 2 at 5, 3 at 11, 4 at 17. Um, you can make, uh, you can direct the beams at the same target or at different ones. Make a separate attack roll for each beam. Great. And again, that's a cantrip, so you can cast that as much as you want. So that's going to be, again, your main consistent attack. And that's at 300 feet because of the other invocation I took. The next cantrip I have is Minor Illusion. Casting time 
one action range, 30 feet, duration one minute. You create a sound or a spell, uh, sound or an image of an object within range that lasts for the duration. Uh, you can also dismiss it at will, or when you, you know, when you cast another action, uh, I misspoke, but basically you cast that spell, it doesn't require concentration, so you can have multiple spells up at a time. Uh, basically, you can create a sound or an image that is small, it only can take up a five foot cube worth of size, uh, if it's an image. If someone sees it, they can roll a save to potentially see through the illusion, more or less. Uh, message is one action, 120 feet, duration one round, uh, basically... Yeah, you can whisper a message, the target, and only that target hears the, mes hears the message and can reply in a whisper that only you can hear. Um, uh, you can cast the spell through solid objects that you are familiar with. Um, if you know the target is behind the barrier, um, but it's blocked from magical silence, a foot of stone, blah 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 with lead, and blah 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 blah, blah whatever. Um, but you, it only lasts one round, which is six seconds. So you can really only do a six second long message in that. Okay, we have Mage Hand. One action, range 30 feet, duration one minute. A uh, floating hand appears at, um, you know, within range that you pick. Last the duration of the spell, it can move 30 feet um, away from you every turn. Uh, you can use your action to control the hand, to manipulate objects, open and unlock doors and containers, still retrieve items, open containers, or pour contents into a vial, for example. It can't attack, activate magic items, or carry more than 10 pounds. So you can use to carry things, pick up, drop things, things like that from a distance. It's also good at setting off traps from a distance, too. Has a lot of fun utility. Okay, Vicious Mockery. One action, 60 feet. Duration is instant. Um, basically, you unleash a string of insults laced with subtle enchantments at a creature you can see within range uh, if the target can hear you. Though it does not necessarily need to understand you. Um, it must succeed a ways in saving throw, or you take 1d4 psychic damage and have disadvantage on the next attack roll that it makes before the end of its next turn. So basically, on its turn, if it goes to attack, it rolls two 20 sided dice, and whatever is the lowest amount, that's the roll. Yeah, so that's it as far as cantrips go. I like vicious mockery in a sense of like, let's say you're in a desperate spot uh, and you just need to, to kind of help you get away from a situation or stay alive. An enemy's right up next to you hitting you and you're about to die if you give them disadvantage on your attack, they're less likely to hit you. Uh, it's not so much about damage because your Eldritch Blast can definitely do more damage. But if you really, really need to just stay alive a little bit longer, it's pretty good. That and like Shocking Grasp also is good and you could argue that might be a better option, but whatever. Okay, so again, those you, you can cast as many times as you want per day. Uh, and then as far as uh, your other spells, you can cast them once per day unless you take a nap, basically. Take a rest. You cast them once per day and they recharge upon a short rest. A little nap, basically. Uh, so... Hex is also arguably a bread and butter kind of spell for Warlock. Pretty much everyone takes it. Um, yeah. It's a bonus action. Range 90 feet. Concentration up to an hour. So you can only have one concentration spell up at a time. You place a curse on a creature that you can see within range until the spell ends. You deal an extra 1d6 necrotic damage to the target whenever you hit it with an attack. Also, choose one ability. When you cast the spell, the target has disadvantage. Again, you roll two dice, pick the lower. On ability checks, made with the chosen ability. If the target drops to zero hit points before this spell ends, you can use a bonus action on a subsequent turn of yours to curse a new creature. A remove cursed spell cast on the target ends the spell early. And it becomes a little stronger 
higher levels. Okay. Then we have Armor of Agathis, one action, range self duration, one hour. Protective magical force surrounds you, manifesting as a spectral frost that covers you and your gear. You gain temporary five hit points for the duration. If a creature hits you with a melee attack while you uh, have these hit points, the creature takes five cold damage and it becomes stronger at higher levels. Then you have Arms of Hadar. Okay. Tendrils of dark energy erupt from you and batter all creatures within 10 feet of you. Each creature in that area must make a save, strength saving throw on a failed save. The target takes 2d6 necrotic damage and can't take reactions until the next turn. On a successful save, the creature takes half damage but suffers no other effect and it does get stronger too at higher levels then we have charm person one action 30 feet duration one hour you attempt to charm a humanoid you can see within range it must make a wisdom saving throw and does so with advantage if you or your companions are fighting it if it fails the saving throw, it is charmed by you until the spell ends, or until you or your companions do anything harmful to it. The charmed creature regards you as a friendly acquaintance. When the spell ends, the creature knows it was charmed by you. At higher levels, you can basically target more creatures at a time. Then we have burning hands. One action range self a 15 foot cone in front of you so basically one square in front of you then two squares out of it and then three squares out of it so a cone shape duration is instant uh, basically everyone in that 15 foot cone must take a dexterity saving throw and if the creature takes 3d6 fire damage on a failed save um, and half as much if they succeed the save and also, it gets stronger at higher levels. And last but not least, we have command. Uh, so basically, 60 feet away, duration for one round. In essence, you can look at a creature and give it a simple command like stop. If it fails it's safe, it stops moving. If you say drop an item, let's say it's holding a sword, you tell it to drop its sword, it drops the sword. Right? So it's like a simple one word command and to its best of its ability and its intelligence, it will do that command, right? So you could say run and it's just gonna run straight forward and that's it, you know, stop, um, surrender, I don't know, you know, within reason, that's basically all it is. It can be pretty useful sometimes. Okay, and lastly, like I was saying, as far as the spells get stronger at higher levels, the good thing about a warlock is, yes, they have the least um, uh, spell slots, but they can recharge them on like a quick little nap, but they have the least amount of spells that they can cast per day, which is why they have like Eldritch Blast, which is a pretty strong spell um, that you can spam over and over again, and it gets pretty strong uh, as you level up. Um, but anyway... Um, you always cast at the highest spell level, okay? So as you level up, you get access to level 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 spells, right? So like, uh, if I cast a Burning Hands as if it were a 4th level spell, I'm just going to get 4 extra dice to add on to it. So instead of like 3d8, it becomes uh, 4 plus 3d8 or I don't know, whatever. The different spells have those information listed, um, but yeah, it basically means that no matter what, even if you use it as like a level one spell slot, it's always going to count as having the effects of the highest spell level that it has. So again, their spells are going to be constantly cast at the most powerful that they can be, but they don't have a lot of those spells. So just spam out your blast and you have a couple spells to sling here or there at their highest potency sparingly. That's basically it. Have a good day. Hopefully
Hopefully you didn't mind this stupidly long video.